Thanks to the microclimate at these high elevations, the villages of Alain are able to grow species typically seen in the Mediterranean basin. Lower down, the oases of Jebel Akhtar are home to more heat-resistant plants, such as date palms. But in the middle of this rocky landscape, these mosaics of crops could never have taken root without one vital element. Hundreds of channels thread through Jebel Akhtar's many oases. They are known as Falaj. The Arabic word Falaj means the place where water flows. For millennia, these networks of channels have been the lifeline of Oman's oasis villages. In Burkett Al Mous, the local children use the Falaj as a swimming pool. This is one of the oldest channels still in use in the region. For 400 years, it has snaked along the streets before irrigating the crops below. This fallage flows through the neighborhood, in the middle of the old village. This is my grandfather's home, and my other grandfather's house was over there. We always walked along the fallage. We'd swim, wash, and perform our ablutions here. Kami Saldugeshi is the village wakil. In other words, the custodian of the water. The wakil has many roles and responsibilities. Each village has a wakil. He oversees water distribution, services, the general upkeep of the village, and collects fees. We're going to open the channel for this plot. Its owner is allowed an hour's worth of irrigation. Each person has a specific number of water time shares. Some people have 30 minutes, others 10 minutes, or two hours. It all depends on the size of the plot and the amount of crops that need irrigating. The daily life of Birkit al Muz's farmers is dictated by the opening of the Falash. Kamis makes sure that each farmer respects his allocated irrigation time. Oman's irrigation system is its greatest resource. Like generations of wakils before him, he looks after this precious water. This water is as valuable as the blood flowing through my veins. I am happy and proud to be responsible for this water, for this village, for this ancestral heritage. The previous wakil passed it on to me in a good state of repair, and I want to pass it on to future generations in the best possible state. In this desert landscape, water is a precious and rare commodity. So to conserve this resource, Jebel Akhtar's oasis farmers have cleverly organized their plantations on several levels. Typical of the Omani oases is this multi-layered system of agriculture. At the top, you have date palms, which benefit from direct sunlight. Then there are bananas, or citrus fruits, or mangoes, which are there. And right at the bottom, you have fodder crops. The advantage of this multi-layered system is that the crops growing at the lower levels are protected from direct sunlight. At 
the top of the date palms, temperatures can exceed 45 degrees Celsius. Whereas at ground level, they never exceed 30 degrees. But that isn't all. These milder temperatures help keep evaporation to a minimum and maintain adequate moisture in the oasis. The oases have a unique microclimate. The air moisture level is much higher. The relative humidity of the air is 20 to 25 percent, whereas the humidity recorded in the oasis in the morning ranges between 80 and 100 percent. This is essentially due to the cooling effect. Thanks to the Omani farmers' know-how, the oases of Jebel Akhtar have survived for centuries, despite the hostile environment. These oases have stood the test of time. They were sustainable before we even thought about what sustainability meant. Because it was necessary to survive in this climate with these environmental constraints, namely high temperatures and limited water availability. In the heart of one of the world's most arid regions, vegetation has managed to thrive, lulled by the sweet melody of the water flowing in the fallage. For centuries, people have had to use their ingenuity to harness this rare resource. But where does this coveted water supply come from? On the surface, the mountains are dry and barren. It only rains a few days each year. But the bowels of this Omani mountain range contain millennia-old treasure. Between 30,000 and 6,000 years before our era, the climate of Oman was slightly more humid than today. Rain poured down the mountain slopes and seeped into the ground until it reached a layer of impermeable rock. It is these water reservoirs known as aquifers, which the people of Jebel Akhtar have exploited for centuries. Over 2,000 years ago, the mountain dwellers managed to tap this precious resource to cultivate the land. Guided by the thin strips of vegetation clinging to the rock, they located the few spots where water comes to the surface. The high altitude oases are thus irrigated thanks to this resurgence of groundwater. And the region's natural reservoirs are recharged by seasonal rainfall. But at the foot of the mountains, as in Birkit al Muz, farmers had to find other solutions to transport water over longer distances. This fellage is a complex engineering one. This is a tunnel dug inside the soil for uh, several kilometers. Some afflage, even uh, the tunnel is up to 17 kilometers. And also, they are tributaries. I mean, you have the main tunnel, then you have sub tunnels assisting the main tunnel. And these systems uh, tap the water without any uh, external energy, so just mainly by gravity. After locating the groundwater reservoirs, people dug tunnels beneath the mountains. Thanks to a gentle slope, they were able to convey the water from the aquifers to the low altitude oases several kilometers away. Beket al Mouz, water quality and availability are closely monitored. Abdullah al Ghafri heads up Nizwa University's Aflash Research Unit. He and his team record the state and flow of these channels all over Oman. It's important to measure the flow rate because we can assess how much water is available and uh, how much water is getting less by time. Usually this village is uh, never dried up, usually so far, and I hope it's continue like that. The afflage is not important as a water system. 
or as agricultural system. It is part of our heritage, it's part of our culture, it's part of our history. In fact, for me, it's identity. It's our identity, in fact.